Each one of us can remember the childhood experiences which have shaped and influenced who we are now. Our guest today is a man whose deepest concern is for the growing up world of children. His life's work is dedicated to children by becoming a participant in their everyday lives and family relationships. For his television program and other special presentations, Mr. Rogers chooses themes that are relevant to the everyday growing experiences of children. He deals with the importance of adult parent relationships. He teaches children about anger and sorrow and fear. He challenges their coordination skills and creativity. He also addresses the very realistic issues of discipline, death, and divorce. He began his work in educational TV at Pittsburgh's WQED in 1953. He was station programmer and soon moved on to co-write and produce, as well as perform in his first children's program called Children's Corner, which ran for seven years. In 1964, he shaped what was a 15-minute daily program into his half-hour Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which is now carried by over 250 PBS stations, and you can see it locally on KCET. He has received numerous awards for his contributions to children, um, including a film award, a gold award for, at the International Film Festival of New York in 1982, three awards at the American Film Festival in 1981, and along with several nominations, an Emmy in 1981 for Outstanding Achievement in Children's Programming. There is probably no other television personality who has gained the trust of children, families, and educators. He's admired for the deep caring and seriousness with which he addresses issues that are important to children. He is a man worthy of our respect and certainly of our gratitude. Let's give him a warm UCLA Bruin welcome, Mr. Rogers. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be with you. Well, I'll clap for you. Will you sing with me? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Good. It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Now it's about time to... I've always wanted... with you so let's make the most of this beautiful day since we're together we might as well say would you be mine could you be mine won't you be my neighbor won't you please won't you please please won't you be my neighbor, and that's how you sing it when you have a big cold. <laughs> now I've got to change my shoes. I, I... What about John Costa and his musical offerings on our neighborhood? I work with some of the most wonderful people, and we really do have a neighborhood that cares about each other. How many of you all watched the neighborhood as you were growing up? You did, really? in this state or other states in different places well you know we when I was in college I thought I was going to go off to the seminary right after college and I got home at Easter vacation and I saw 
people on television, and television was quite new then, and I saw them throwing pies in each other's faces. And I thought, that is certainly something that seems to be so demeaning to me. Now, we certainly could do something better than that. But I hear some, some crying. Do I? <laughs> oh, there's some little children here. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi, sweetie. Thank you very much. Is that, oh, you want a cake? You want to keep it? Do you? Hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, could I open it up now? All right. How do you do? Thank you coming, for coming to visit us. I think we're probably all curious to see what this is. Well, thank you. And happy birthday to you whenever you have one. That's what? Jordan. This is Jordan's. Did this is mine. Would you would you help me to open yours? Please? Can you help me to open that one? Good for you. You made it for me. Well, thank you very much. I, I made this one for you. You made this one? Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what, what yours is like. Look at that. Good for you. What a treat. I'll take those home with me. And you know I like you just the way you are. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. That one's you. You, you and, and Jordan. This one's you, and this one's me, and this is Jordan. Thank you very much. And I like th that you brought yourselves. That's the best present of all. It certainly is. Now, why don't we just sing something to you all? who came today. Could we sing it you I like? Okay. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now. The way down deep inside you. We've got some comforting to do here. Not the things that hide you, not your toys, they're just beside you. I think it's very strange for him to see me away from the television. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he quite got to say hello to you now. He, he didn't. He was real excited about it. Now we had our chance, isn't it? See, that's just a little... We'll finish that song later, but I, there's some... <laughs> There's something I need to talk about, and that is many children see me and they say, how did you get out? And, <laughs> and that really is hard to understand because when you're this big, you're trying to get the world in its place. And even when you're in school, sometimes you see your teacher in a supermarket or something and that's just the wrong place. didn't know that we'd have young ones, real young ones with us, but yes, <laughs> hi to you. <laughs> would you like, would you like to touch? <laughs> it's just a little too real. <laughs> you know, I often wonder if, if children see me here whether they think that when they see all those scary things on television that they could come out too. Well, they can't. I'm a real person and that's why I can be here with you today.
the television is just a picture. And the other things on TV, uh-huh, Roger's up there. Hello? Yes, I think maybe we better show the puppets right away. I don't think... <laughs> I expected all college students, and so this is going to be very different from what we expect. Hello. Now you see what we, what we have here. The first one I'll show you is a daddy who lives in a castle. Do you know who that might be? King Friday the 13th. When King Friday comes to visit, he, he likes to have you address him two times. He likes you to say, how do you do King Friday? How do you do, King Friday? Yes, this is Mr. Rogers up here. <laughs> do they know how to address me, Mr. Rogers? Well, I don't know, King Friday. If you turn around, perhaps they will. You remember what I said. He likes you to say, how do you do, King Friday, two times. Okay, Mr. Costa, my fanfare, please. Excellent. Excellent. I'm very glad to be here and to see you royal people. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, this is UCLA. LA, is it not? Yes. Uh, uh, do you here know the little song called uh, Rowing Your Boat Down the Stream? Uh, do you know that song? Uh, would you all sing it for me? Uh, young and medium, uh, elderly uh, alike. Uh, oh, that's excellent. Is that the way they teach it to you here? Well, I, I, when I went to the uh, to the Kingly School, I majored in large words. Uh, and uh, the way I learned this song, uh, and I will now give you that rendering, is propel, propel, propel your craft gently down liquid solution. Ecstatically, 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 ecstatically. Existence is but an illusion. Thank you very much, yes. Thank you. Well, since that was so pleasing to you, uh, perhaps you would... Do you remember the, uh, that little ditty? It's not a song, it's a poem. Yes, Mr. Rogers is up here, yes. Uh. It seems almost inconceivable, doesn't it? Yes. Uh. Well, I'm going to tell you my words to the twinkling of the little star. Do you remember that poem? Uh, you don't need to sing it, just say it. Uh, how does it go? Twinkle, twinkle.
Oh, that's excellent. Yes, you have learned that well. Now, the way we learned in my master's course uh, was uh, scintillate, scintillate, diminutive stellar orb. How inexplicable to me seems the stupendous problem of your existence. <laughs> Elevated at such an immeasurable distance in an apparently perpendicular direction <laughs> from this terrestrial planet which we occupy. Resembling in thy dazzling and unapproachable effulgence a gem of purest carbon set solitaire in a university of space. Thank you very much. There we That's right. Someone who lives in a museum. Lady Elaine. Oh, thanks, Toots. That's really appropriate for me. I wanted to say greetings to all of you, and I wasn't sure I'd have a voice, but uh, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Well, you're welcome, Lady Elaine. Just wanted to say you're always welcome at my museum, toots, and I'll try not to get out my boomerang, tumerang, sumerang, and turn you upside down. <laughs> That's right, X the owl. I have X the Owl, and then I have one more after X the Owl, and then you're going to be able to go off with your parents after that, because we'll have a lot of grown-up talk after that. Okay? Oh, here I am. I'm X the Owl, and I'm flying around. Howdy-do. Hello. Hello. And hello to you. <laughs> hello. Uh, would you like to make your arms go like wings? That's right, just like that. That's good. Very good. Boy, you all are good flyers. That's right. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye. Now there's one more, and his name is Daniel Tiger. He's very, very shy. And sometimes he can't even talk to new people when he meets them. He's so shy. Let's just see how he feels today. I don't think I could meet anybody new today. Well, that's all right, Daniel. But my, my one stripe feels awful itchy. He has this one stripe on the back of his, uh, his neck that's a new stripe, and it gets quite itchy. So maybe if you just would pretend, scratch it. That's good. That, that's good. He can feel that, because he's a pretend tiger. <laughs> oh, that feels a lot better, huh? Well, he took one look at you. Maybe if you'd just call out to him and say, uh, I like you, Daniel. Hi. Oh, now I feel better. I sure do. I feel a lot better. <laughs> Did you ever get shy when you meet new people? Do you? So do I. Sometimes I don't even know what to say. But I'd like to give you a pretend hug if you could hold your arms out like that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's good. You can hug yourself, too, if you want to. <laughs> and what about you all? Why don't you hug somebody near? Oh, thank you, Daniel. That's good. Yes. What? Would you like to ask me something? I would be glad to give you a pretend kiss. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. I'm really glad you came to visit. That made our visit something special. Now, how are we doing on time? Because I don't want to take away from your time. I, want, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my going uh, to New York right after college and uh, joining the staff at NBC. And, of course, all of the, all of the programs were live then. And uh, somebody asked me yesterday, what was one of the toughest things that... Uh, that you can remember. And I remember one day I was floor managing the Kate Smith Hour. And Miss Smith was in, of course, uh, there were all kinds of flats behind. And for every song, we would have a different scene. But of course, they'd be on a commercial while we were changing the flats. Well, she was in the middle of a song, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was in the front of a farmhouse. And I gave the wrong cue, and the farmhouse started to go up. And, of course, on camera, that looked like she was going down. <laughs> well, happily, I was watching a monitor, and I stopped it when it was in midair. And n not too many people said too much about it, but uh, that was one of the toughest things that I think I ever had. And then there was a time when we were doing an opera, and uh, the lead in the opera decided that she would have a fight with the composer's wife. And so they fought in the afternoon, and we were to go on. Of course, it was live that night. It was called Trouble in Tahiti by Leonard Bernstein. Well, that gives it away who the, uh, who the one person was, doesn't it? Well, at any rate, uh, my wife took, took the actress home and... Uh, and took good care of her in the late afternoon and by the evening she came back and did the performance. But in that same day, it, what a day, uh, the sets had all been done by the cartoonist by the name of Steinberg. Do you know any of his work? Well, it, in a very cartoon style, all of the flats were painted by him. And the producer came in and he had not seen the sets before. And there were five sets. And he looked at them and he said, uh, I don't like three of them. Paint them out. So we went on that night with three of the sets completely painted out. But you know, I wouldn't give up those days of live television for anything. I really learned so much. And I've said it before, but when I floor managed, uh, what was his name? Gabby Hayes. Gabby Hayes. I asked him, this was very early on when I was there, I asked him what he thought when he looked at the camera and knew that there were millions of people there. And he said, I, Freddie, I just think of one little buckaroo. And I think that's what I've always thought as I looked at the camera was one child, not a specific child, but I've worked with a lot of children in my life and I have two boys of my own and I, I think of the needs of kids as they're growing. And I just wonder about some of, of your feelings about our work, about other people's work, and I know that this is a forum and that's why I would like to encourage you all to, I think that there are a couple of, uh, of microphones. What is our time now? Because I'm very conscious of that. It's 12.30. Okay, it really is time now for, for you all to, uh, to bring your concerns or your comments to me, if you will. Where, where are those two microphones? They told me that there would be. Oh, good. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things, in your opinion, that parents don't do in raising their kids that they should and that should seem obvious? One of the things I feel is so important is to try to be in touch with our own childhoods. 
Uh, we've just finished a book which will be out in June called Mr. Rogers Talks with Parents. And one of the things that I try to do in that book is to help parents be more in touch with what they went through when they were their own children's ages. I, th I think it helps you to be more honest, if you can. Is there somebody else? Um, what do you believe is a child's worst fear and why? Where? I'm over here. I'm sorry, I just can't see and I'd like to be able to. A child's worst fear? And why? Well, I think it depends on how old that child is. We've done programs, for instance, in, in which I have helped children try to understand that you cannot go down the bathtub drain. <laughs> and at Two, that is, that is often a great fear of children, that uh, they don't know that they are too big for that drain. And most of us have forgotten that kind of thing, too. But it really depends on how old they are. Uh -huh. And those of you who are studying the development of the human personality know how very complicated that is. I think one of the overriding fears in all of our lives is that we will be left alone with no one to take care of us, no one to love us. Um, and that, I think that the why is, is fairly obvious. Um, yes. Well, when, a, when one of those fears becomes a reality, how do you suggest in, in helping the child or what can be done to help the child? If, if one should become a reality for them? I think if, if you're thinking about someone being divorced or somebody dying and going away, I think that if a child, for instance, fantasizes that uh, he's, he's angry with his dad, for instance, and he thinks to himself, I wish my dad were dead, and the next day the dad is dead. That child has, has a lot of, of work to do, interior work, and needs a great deal of help with it. Because, well, one of the things we do in the neighborhood is to try to help children realize that wishes don't make things come true. It's the doing that makes things happen, not the wishing. That's the way I would begin to help. Mm -hmm. As we did our work on divorce in the neighborhood, we interviewed many, many people and many children, and so many of them led us to believe that they felt it was their fault that their parents were getting a divorce, no matter what their parents said to them. But over and over again, we tried to help them and their parents tried to help them realize that that was a grown-up thing. But nevertheless, there are those thoughts. Thank you Thank very you much. for that. Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. How do you feel about the satires that are done on your show, in particular like the Johnny Carson sketches or even Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood? Yeah. But you know, I think I better sit for this one. <laughs> Sometimes some of these things bother me. I think it depends on how well I'm feeling. Last night I thought, are people really making fun of me? And I asked this question to somebody last week. I said, well, what do you think? It's not that I want to throw the question back at you without answering it. I will answer it. But I'd like to know what you think uh, I might be feeling. And this, th this person said, uh, well, as a matter of fact, now that I've gotten to know you better and know what your, your major concerns are and how serious you are about programming for children, that you're not a babysitter, he said, I think they're probably beyond you. That... Uh, 
that uh, that you is that Yale I see on your yes th this was a young man from Yale who told me that <laughs> and that was just two weeks ago uh, I don't know that I'm I'm beyond it all the time I'm I must confess to you that when I was a kid I was an only child and I was exceedingly sensitive and when I would hear people laughing I would sometimes think they were laughing at me and I'm not sure that anybody really likes to be laughed at but I must say after I have met Mr. Carson and met uh, Eddie Murphy I th I think that those people are uh, I think they're people of goodwill. Uh, Eddie Murphy was was thrilled. I was over at uh, at NBC working on the David Letterman program one day, and uh, David Newell said to me, "You know, Eddie Murphy's right upstairs rehearsing. Why don't we just go up and say, well." He was very pleased that we came, and he just threw his arms around me. So I think that there is a certain affection that these people uh, bring to their their parodies. There are some that I that I heartily disapprove of. In fact, I get very angry about them, and those are ones which can potentially hurt children. And I don't know whether you've heard about any of these, but there are some disc jockeys, for instance, who will say, uh, now go get your mother's hairspray, and uh, in my voice, and evidently there are a lot of people who can sound like me. <laughs> and they say, go get your mother's hairspray and your father's cigarette lighter and press the buttons together and I don't think it's funny. I do not think it's a bit funny. And you will have a blowtorch. I think it's I think it's heinous because there could be kids and kids do trust me. There could be kids who hear those people on the radio doing stupid stuff like that who could think that it was I and go and try some of those things out. And these are not done in late evening hours, these are done in afternoon hours. I'm very serious about the work I do. I've studied long and hard and tried to understand what we all go through in our striving to grow, and it's not easy to grow. It's very tough. It's not easy to be a very young child. It's not easy to be an adolescent. Lord knows it's not easy to be an adolescent. It's not easy to be a college student, and it's not easy to be a parent. I have two college-age sons. One of them is going to college at night, part-time, works as a mechanic in a car shop in the daytime, He's nuts about cars. The other one tried college for about a half a year and decided he wouldn't go on with it. He's working in a hospital now. I would like both of them to have done what I did. That would have been nice. That would have been the easier way. But they didn't. And they know very well that what I say on the neighborhood is what I say at home and that is that everybody is different and we all have our ways of growing and they're different Lord knows what those two boys will become at the base of them is a certain kindness I sense it in their relationships with others and I'm proud of that we don't have to be mirror images of anybody. How unfortunate it would be in this world if we all looked alike and sounded alike and did the same parodies. Thank you. Yeah.
Mr. Rogers. Yeah. What do you feel the effects of sex and violence on television is upon the youth today? There are some things on television that, uh, that people can't handle very well. I think that the major drama that goes on as far as any television viewing is concerned is the drama that we, the viewer, brings to the set. And if a person is, is working on violent urges within himself or herself and brings that to the television set in which there is blatant display of violence, then I think that that can be exceedingly unhealthy. In translating it in, in terms of children's viewing, I think that programmers and parents have enormous responsibility as far as selectivity is concerned. If people watch soap operas all afternoon at home, how can they expect their children to become selective in their television viewing as they grow? The television sets just like the refrigerator in a home. What is seen on it what is in the refrigerator, it tells the story to the kid of what's acceptable in that family. What is seen by the adults on television, what's enjoyed by them, tells the kid what's acceptable, what's traditional in their family. It has become a part of American tradition. What pleases me now is that there are there really are some people who grew up with the neighborhood who have their own babies, their own children now, and are offering it like a, like a classic. And what they're doing is, is telling how they feel about who they were back then. And then they sit with their children and, and it becomes second generation and all the more important. I'd like to know what, what you're thinking as you ask me that question. I don't want, mean to put you on the spot, but I, I'm curious to know, what do you think about so much violence and, I, I don't call it sex, I, uh, because sex is a good thing. Uh, what, what I call it is uh, a disregard for, for the values of, uh, of humans and their bodies. Is, is that what you mean by when you say violence and sex? Yeah, well you hear so much today about how the children of the United States are watching so much television and not so much reading or becoming involved in the family. I mean they're watching six hours a day or what of television and it's becoming such a major factor in their lives. And there are these studies all the time about sex and violence and, and how it affects the children and I was just wondering on your views on that. Yeah. What concerns me is that in Shakespeare there's plenty of violence for instance but you always know that there is a consequence to it. People don't just shoot somebody and forget them. There is a consequence. Okay, we just have time for one more question. Oh, no. Hi, Mr. Rogers. Um, my question concerns a theory that's come up uh, with parenting, namely, uh, recently parents have waited longer to have children, and when they do, the tradition of the mother leaving her job to take care of the children has become somewhat a thing of the past, um, a career continues, and the theory is that 
the quantity is more important than uh, the quality, excuse me, is more important than the quantity of time that a parent spends with the children. And I'm wondering how you feel about that. I don't think that you can have any quality at all without a certain amount of quantity. I think people... I really do feel that people are in a quandary at times because they just don't they don't have the means of raising their uh, their children and yet there are others who feel that they 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 ta they w need to take on jobs for other reasons and a, a very young child at least until age 3 needs one mothering person does that have to be the actual mother? It does not, but if the actual mother wants to give up that chance to grow herself, she must be aware that she is giving up something as she does not participate in those first three years of her child's growing. There, there is more about this in the book, and, and I hope that your school will have some copies of it, and I, I hope that you can read about it. I, I wish we had a lot longer to talk about a lot more things, because you are very thoughtful people, and uh, it, it could expand me greatly to be able to be in touch with each one of you. But let's end by uh, singing the song that we often sing at the end of the neighborhood, which is called, what's it called, John? <laughs> it's such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling you're growing inside. And when you wake up ready to say, I think I'll make a snappy new day. Thanks. It's such a good feeling. A very good feeling, the feeling you know that I'll be back when the day is new and I'll have more ideas for you and you'll have things you'll want to talk about. I will too. You always make each day such a special day. You know how. By just your being you, there's only one person in the whole world like you. You know, that's true for now. It's true for the past. True for the future. There will never be anybody exactly like you. It's such a good feeling, a very good feeling. The feeling you know that we're friends, and I feel we are. Thanks so much. <laughs>